To all who are joining us online and to all who are gathered here, a welcome to our service. We are gathering here at Grace United Methodist in Gaithersburg, Maryland. My name is Jim Miller, and along with Deacon Helen Ballou, we look forward to our time of worshiping together, as you can see by our banner of giving thanks. I give thanks that you are here. So much is happening in the life of the church for which we are grateful. I invite you to visit our church webpage at graceumc.org. It'll tell you about all of our ministries, and we also put out a weekly e-blast entitled Grace Notes on our website. You can sign up for that, and that is an email, or if you're not uh, in the computer and would like a hard copy, we mail that to you each week. That includes a, an order of worship that you'll be seeing here on screen. So as we gather, I just want to say thank you to those who are who are joining us. I know for, for many, we are still about one-third of our attendance is in person, two-thirds online. I am grateful and know that you would want to be here, but you are taking the safest path right now, and I commend you for that. As much as we miss being in person with you, I am thankful that you are loving others and yourself enough that you, if you are at risk to be out, that you're staying home, that you are taking precaution. And to all who are gathered here, thank you for making the journey out. And I thank you for the safety precautions that, that are in place that are so important. I know there are some extra steps. We're masking, whether except when we are speaking. And so I thank you for masking. And please, when you do wear the mask, be sure that it's covering your nose as well as your mouth. Again, we are practicing the distancing. And thank you for your care for one another as we are making it through this time together and as we continue to pray for one another. So as the Caroline played, that is music that's playing through our bell tower to the community to let them know it's a time to set aside, to give thanks back to God. So you're here, we're joining you online to do just that, to offer God our thanks. Let us now take this time to center ourselves as we receive this morning's prelude.
Please join me in the call to worship. The call is made to each of us. It requires much. The call requires that we follow the Ten Commandments. It requires more. God asks for our whole selves. Christ asks that we follow his teachings and example with all we have and all we are. It is not an easy path. It is not. But with God's help, with God's help, it is possible. Come and worship the one who calls and the one who makes it possible. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious one, when we gather in your name, we are changed. There is no way around it. We cannot come together in your presence and not be moved. So today, we surrender to your moving and to the ways you desire to change us. Let this hour together be sacred, and may your name be made great. You are holy, worthy, and full of glory. We are humbled to be in your presence. Receive our worship as an offering of praise. It is all for you. Amen. Now I invite you to stand as you are able for our opening hymn, Give Thanks. It's number 2036 in the Faith We Sing hymnal. Amen. We have gathered to do just that, to give thanks. Please be seated. At this time, Terry Fowler will share with us about our Kids Club ministry. Thank you, Terry, for leading us in this ministry.
Good morning, church. I know that some of you may be disappointed, but out of an abundance of caution for our children and the children in community, we are continuing to do only virtual activities. So we have postponed our trunk and treat and we look forward to the blessings that we will have in 2022 when we plan this event to be bigger and better than it's ever been. But we are not stopping the work that we do with our children. We will continue to have virtual events. And to that end, on that day on October 30th, from 7 to 9 p.m., we will have a virtual harvest party that is available not only to the children of grace, but children in the community. And if our VBS spoke to anything, children in our community does not mean Gaithersburg proper or even Maryland proper. So for those of you who are watching online, we invite children from all over to participate in this event. All you need to do is email me at kidsclub at graceumc and let me know that your children would like to participate. And if they're not in the local area, if you provide your mailing address, we will mail the materials out to you. So please email me to let me know that your children will participate. And those children in the area, we will have a local pickup like we have done over the past entire year. We did not stop our ministries because of what has happened in the world. We continued for the past year and had events almost every month with our children, and we will continue to do so. And also, I just want to remind you that this is a ministry. It is our goal to reach out with the love of Christ to children, again, not just of grace, but children in the community, and especially those in need. So we will be kicking off our winter season collection of new coats, hats, scarves, mittens, or gloves. So please contribute as you are able. We will have uh, receptacles probably starting next week that you can bring your items to the church and we will be distributing those in preparation for the colder months to children in need throughout the community. We thank you for your continued support. We look forward to the time when we can come together in one place but wherever God is, we are together. So we welcome you to our virtual events and we look forward to seeing you on October 30th. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, and how true. The children's ministries have continued. You have found creative ways to engage us and continue. So please help spread the news. Again, that's kidsclub at graceumc.org. I'd like to say a special moment at this time to our younger children uh, who are joining us online today. So good morning to all of you and glad that you are part of our worship experience. I'm standing right here because you have probably noticed this banner that's here in our sanctuary today and that simply says, I know some of you don't read yet, give thanks. Every time we gather to worship, that's what we're doing. Sometimes we think, well, give thanks. That's more of a Thanksgiving theme. That's next month. No, every time we worship, every time we gather in Jesus' name, we're doing just that. So I want to invite you today to be thinking about ways you can give thanks to Jesus. You're off to a great start. You're giving thanks by gathering to worship him. That's what this day is about, this Sabbath day. We gather to worship, and so we are offering our thanks through song, as you heard, through words, through the scripture, and through reflection. And there'll be Sunday school that follows at 11.30, a time to study God's word. How important it is we have God's word. We see that in today's story. You see, there was a rich young man who came running to Jesus, just saying, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life. He had a very good question for Jesus, and actually a very healthy question. What must I do? Can you imagine if we all started each day offering that to God? Lord, what must I do? What would you have me do? You'd see a lot of difference in our world today. Jesus reminded him of the commandments, which we find in the Bible. 
And the man said, well, I've kept those since I was young. But then Jesus said, oh, but there's one thing you lack. And he told the man to go and sell everything he has and give it to the poor and follow him. Now, that's why it's so important that we study together as a church, because if you were just to read that by yourself and say, okay, mom and dad, the Bible says we're, we're supposed to sell everything we have and give it all away and have, no. What Jesus was pointing out to the young man, there was this obstacle. Sometimes our worry about monies, possessions, or the clothes we wear, or things we have, they're not wrong in and of themselves, they're, they're important. But when they take the place of God, for the young man, it was blocking his relationship with God. I love the banner. Now it so happens our bell choir's over here, so it's not an issue, but when our choir's there, I'm gonna have to do something because that's gonna block our view there, so I'll have to change. That's what Jesus was inviting the young man to do. His relationship with God was being blocked by worrying so much about his possession that he was missing out on the joy. When we give back, when we give thanks, and that can happen in a number of ways, in praise, in prayer, but also as we just heard, gathering as our kids club, being part of our ministry to provide new winter coats for those who would be without otherwise, that's also how we give thanks. So this week, be thinking about how can you be saying thanks to God? And if there's something that's blocking your way, give that to God, and God will show you how to change and make a path that God may always be first in your life. Thank you for being here today. Amen. As I was pointing out to the children, we are beginning a very special time in the life of the church. That is our stewardship campaign that is happening throughout October. It's a very simple but profound, and that is to give thanks. And the part of that giving thanks is to focus on the ways we do that. And one of the ways we give thanks, give back to God, is through our financial giving. And so I've been asking various groups uh, to be sharing and answering this question, why I give. And so today you're going to hear from our finance committee. I invite you to experience this video. Why do you give? I mean, to show thanks, show gratitude, um, to give back the blessings that I've been given. I like uh, two phases. One would be uh, the opportunities to, uh, to enjoy spiritual growth uh, through uh, the Sunday services, uh, as well as the uh, opportunity to uh, study the Bible in, uh, in uh, Sunday school uh, uh, activities and such. And the uh, second area has to do with uh, our community outreach and the uh, services that we uh, can and do provide to the uh, community. I think those are, are uh, not only good for the overall uh, church and the community, but also gratifying to me. The, the, very, the very structure of giving, I mean, I, I think I found that it's what is. It, it's the natural part of who we are, or at least I'll say it's the natural part of who Maggie and I are. Kathy and I were, were blessed. We both grew up in United Methodist <laughs> churches, educated at United Methodist College. Uh, we were the beneficiaries of, of folks who, who felt the need and the, the beauty of giving. And so we feel like now it's our turn to, to contribute, to give, and, and one of the things that we find so easy about contributing to grace is we see how it's being used and the lives it's touching through our gifts. It's a multiplier for us. We, we can't give enough to have the impact that Grace Church can have by groups of us contributing. Probably the reason we give 
is that we've been doing it so many years, it's a habit. <laughs> um, we, uh, you know, have, have always given uh, to the church, but uh, we particularly uh, uh, give to grace now because we, uh, as others have said, it's, uh, we can see what our money is doing and we, uh, we feel good about that. I just had a reminder, it's, it's not only about our money that we give either. So if we're going to give ourselves the money for us. I've made a lot of friends at Grace. And uh, again, I, I, I give to, uh, to give back. I think for me, it's about the feeling of giving back. That Carol and I feel that our lives are so blessed in so many different ways. Children, grandchildren economic opportunities that we've had and it's us sharing that back to the Lord and grace is just that vehicle mm -hmm. that I do think that uh, I'm with Dick on that that as you look around you can see how your money is serving the Lord mm -hmm. and that's sort of I think what it's about <laughs> Thank you to our finance team and for their sharing. And so our Consecration Sunday will be on October the 31st. I hope you've received a letter, an estimate of giving card. If you haven't, uh, please contact our church office. I know mine came uh, last Thursday in the mail, so I'm hoping that yours has arrived. You're invited to fill that out, to prayerfully consider that, and I hope you'll use that as a teaching moment with your families. For those of you who have children at home, uh, grandchildren, just it's a great way to model that giving back, the prayer that you're giving us. You can send that in at any time. Feel free to mail it to the church, or you can bring it on any Sunday morning and place it here in the plate. Next week, you'll be hearing from some of our musicians. The following week will be our men's from our men's breakfast, and we'll conclude with our outreach in UMW, so we look forward to, and if you would like to share, if you didn't, weren't part of one of those groups, but would like to give a testimony like you heard, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, I'll be doing a Zoom conference, same way you got here to this service, same Zoom information, you would be invited to be part of that conversation. So again, sharing your story, why you give. I give thanks for each of you. Now I invite all who are able to please stand as I share this morning's gospel lesson. A reading from Mark, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 17th verse. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked, went away grieving for he, he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded, said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, 
There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. We will offered by our grace ringers. I love to tell the story.
Thank you all so much how you have allowed a classic hymn to touch our hearts in a new way. Thank you for your sharing. Please pray with me. Lord, we love to tell the story. We thank you that we do, in fact, have a story to tell, a story of your love, a story that includes all of us. You have reminded us in this time of giving thanks how important it is that we continue to tell the story as the familiar lyrics played through our minds for many have not heard. Lord, whatever it is that prevents the story from being heard by all, we pray will be overcome and know it will be. And we know that whatever obstacles stand in our way today, we are reminded, can be overcome because you tell us. Even in times when reality says it is impossible, nothing, nothing is impossible with you. And so we pray, O oh God, that as we reflect upon your story, help us each to see we have a role to play, an important part to fulfill Use this time to your honor and glory, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love to tell the story. It's not, oh, I'm supposed to, or I guess I have to. All right, if nobody else will do it, I guess I, no. I love to tell the story. That's the joy that flowed through what was shared. And I've happened to buy enough rehearsals from time to time to know you all have a good time preparing and, yes, telling the story. And that's true of every ministry group, the kids' club that you just heard about, and the, the work together and the ministries together. There is love behind all of this. These folks are busy like you are. They get up early, many go to work and have families to care for, face significant issues, and yet do what they're doing. Why? It's not the paycheck, it's not the fame. They love to tell the story. We are each called to tell the story in our own way. And through it all, we are offering our thanks to God. This is their way of giving thanks. There is so much joy in ministry, joy in the journey, not just the joy that awaits us someday in our heavenly home, whatever that looks like, whatever that will be, but joy right here and now. This is the source, the one we worship this day of our joy, is in fact Jesus the Christ. In this story that we love to tell, this young man, this rich young ruler, if we borrow from the other Gospels and join it here with Mark, seeks Jesus out. I think he's running. I think he's in a hurry. I think he wants to be. I think he's very intense asking this question of Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think he's sincere. I believe he wants to know. Unlike those the last couple of weeks that were approaching Jesus, they wanted to trick him, wanted to hurt him, wanted to stop him however they could because he was so threatening to their ways, to the way of life that they had known. But here is the story. This man comes with sincerity. Good teacher. And right away, Jesus points out to him, why do you call me good? This wasn't Jesus being rude. This wasn't Jesus correcting him in language or anything like that, but rather, hear what you're saying, Jesus is saying to him. Why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. He wanted the young man to know, to be sure that he knew. Jesus was not just a great philosopher, a great teacher, a dynamic speaker, charismatic leader. Jesus is God in the flesh, present for them. God coming to us all is what the Bible tells us, the story we love to tell over and over again. Why do you call me good? There's only one who is good. You know the commandments Jesus said to him. 
And Jesus lists several of them. You know, you shouldn't lie, you shouldn't steal, you should honor your father and mother, you shouldn't commit adultery. And, and the young man speaks up right away, Lord, I've, I've kept these since I was a child, since I was a youth. And then Jesus says, but there's one thing that you lack. But notice what happens before Jesus says that. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looks at us. You may feel like nobody looks at you, like nobody notices you, that you're just a number to the government, you're just one of millions and millions upon this earth, that your life somehow doesn't matter. Jesus tells us differently. He looks at us and he loves us. That's important news for us to know, and somebody may be hearing this for the very first time this morning, that your life matters to God, that your life is so valuable to God that God would do anything for you to know this story, that God comes to you. We need to hear this. It was a piercing sound I heard just this morning. 3.50 a.m. to be exact. Our smoke alarms went off in our home. Sprang to my feet and thankfully everything was okay. I opened the door my son, Zach, was there. He said, Dad, it was your pizza. And then I remembered. It had been a couple days ago. I brought home a pizza, and Betsy wasn't home yet, so I had some, but I thought, well, I'll put it in the oven, because my dogs like to counter-surf, and so I knew better than to leave it out. So I put it in there and promptly forgot. Zach, who works the night shift, and this was one night off, was hungry during the night, and so he was going to fix something, so he preheated the oven with my pizza box still in it. (laughs) Thankfully, discovered it in time and got it outside, and all all was, but boy, were we ever awake at an early morning hour. But I was grateful. One, convicted that I had done wrong, that I had messed up that I had been forgetful and caring. There was that conviction. But also there was that alert. I'm grateful our our smoke alarms work. They were tested. I'm glad that they're there. I think in this story, to speak for myself, we're, we're convicted in this encounter that Jesus has with this young man. The young man, in all sincerity, sounds like he has led a a, a fine life in keeping the commandments. He wasn't uh, cheating with some other man's wife. He wasn't stealing. He wasn't lying. He wasn't doing any of those those terrible things. But then there there comes this alert. Here is Jesus saying, but there is one thing that you lack. In fact, Jesus takes him back to that very first commandment, to have no other gods before you. Here was Jesus in love, straightening him out. And through the scripture and through the telling of the story, alerting us to how important it is to keep Christ first. We can become so easily forgetful. Even with all the blessings we have to count, even with all that we have to give thanks for, it's so easy with the busyness of life, and with all that's happening to forget. And one of the key ways, and even in our giving financially, oh, I'll I'll get to that, or we'll come back to that later. But here was this alert that Jesus was giving this young man to go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. Now again, this isn't something that Jesus is telling us all to do, that you just should just take that literally and go empty all your accounts and sell your home and not... No, I don't think that's probably what God is calling you to do, but God is calling us. God is seeking to straighten us out where we have become lackadaisical, where we have become forgetful. God is sounding the alert that someone needs to know the good news of God's love. Where we see racism in our world, such as we'll have, are we Rise United meeting this afternoon at 1.30, finding ways to address racism so that no one will be taught or feel they are less than, 
where everyone will be able to lead the life and offer their gifts fully back to God. We are called to a story and telling the story that tells us that God created all that surrounds us and called it good, how important it is that we care for God's creation, that we take steps, that we take intentional steps. The alert is being sounded to be good stewards of this earth. And yes, as we heard in the testimonies, to be giving back. Your giving. I love the sharing where folks were able to look back because of others giving. They were blessed and now they have opportunity to be blessings to others. Who might we bless as a congregation? Who might be warm this winter because someone purchased a new coat in our coat drive? Who might see that their life is valued, even if they're living in a home life in which there there is a lot of unrest? You know they're cared for. That's what a kid's club, that's what a youth ministry is about. I love the fact, if you went by here yesterday, maybe, maybe you saw several of our youth and our trustees were working on our front lawn here to move some flowers, to transplant them from where they were in front of the sign so that they will not grow and block it to a place that was barren. Their work together, prime time, a Saturday, gave of themselves. This was their way of giving back. Your giving, your giving thanks will not only bless your life. Look how we are reminded. Look how the alarm has sounded to us and our own relationship with God. Do we really think that our salvation is something that we do? When in fact it is the gift given to us in Jesus Christ, He is the one who makes us whole. We need to be reminded of this. And no, it's not about us. We have been blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. God has created us and called us good, but the question now is asked, how we can be good for Henry Throw once shared this, and I share it with you. He wrote, be not merely good, be good for something. That was Jesus' challenge to the man who wanted to know what he could do to inherit eternal life. He had been good at making money and being morally upright and keeping the commandments, but that is not the ultimate good. He must also give of himself and what he has in behalf of others. He needed to also realize that the gift without the giver is bare. The gift without the giver is bare. It really isn't just about filling out a pledge card, okay, that's done. No, may the cards that we mail or or bring with us, may they symbolize the commitment behind them of a life out of gratitude expressing our thanks to God. And yes, we give thanks in many ways, and we'll talk about those throughout the year, the other ways that we give thanks, but financially, how might we give? He goes on to quote Wesley. John Wesley proposed an excellent guide to goodness. He said, and he practiced what he preached, by the way, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can at all the times you can as long as you ever can. That quote is on a plaque in my office. It sits right in line. When I'm at my desk, I'm looking right at it. But like any picture or sign, after a while you become sign blind. That is, you don't see it anymore. But reading this quote, I was reminded of it once again. Our all. Of course, Henry Thoreau goes on to, goes on to say, and somebody put it this way, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do or any goodness that I can show to my fellow creatures, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. The importance of today, the opportunity of today that is ours. The disciples, I love those opportunities they had. When Jesus, such as with this encounter with the young man, they are able to have that follow-up conversation. 
And here in Jesus, and it says how hard it is for, for the rich to, to enter into the kingdom. They were perplexed by his words. These were the disciples. These were ones who could have barely said, oh, I know all about that. Uh, well, I've heard Jesus teach. I've, I've been with you. I've traveled with Jesus. But here Jesus is offering a teaching that is challenging, that is perplexive, that causes them to think, wow, we have more to learn. When we give thanks to God, we are opening ourselves to God anew. We are once again recognizing, Lord, there is more I can do. There is more I need to learn. There is more, and there are areas in my life I know that you want me to grow in. Will you be open to God's leading this day? I'm grateful for the paths that the scripture calls us to walk. Here in this path, we're given this story where Jesus goes on to say, I'll tell you, it's more difficult for a camel to go through, through a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Disciples, even more perplexed, say, well, who then can be saved? Jesus says, with mortals, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Here is the good news to whatever situation we are facing, whatever it is that is weighing upon our hearts this day that's happening in our world or happening in the life of the church or the life of our denomination. God will see us through. All things are possible in God. You may think what you are facing is too much, is too overwhelming, that you are tired. Know that in telling the story, hearing the story anew, like me seeing that sign, hearing and experiencing it anew. May this be a day of renewal. What's been a real source of renewal for me recently has been taking my granddaughter Reagan on walks. We often see her on the weekend with her mom and dad working, and so last Sunday afternoon, right after our World Communion Sunday gathering, Reagan was at our house, I said, it's time to go for a walk with Papa. So we, we have a stroller there, and I, I put her in the stroller, and, and we walk the paths, and uh, they, there are walking trails throughout our neighborhood, which I'm very grateful for. And I remember the trails from when my own children were small, and we would go for walks and later bike rides, but it's been a while, so it was so good to, to revisit them once again. Although some of the hills are more steep than they used to be for some reason when I exercise there. It's so good to tell the story because when you do that, you revisit it and you find yourself being asked the question and you find yourself asking the question, Lord, what must I do? This is impossible. This is difficult. And here we are reminded that all things are possible. Later, Peter will will say to Jesus, he says, you know, we, we, we've left everything to follow you. Jesus says, I'll tell you, there will be so much more you will experience. This isn't prosperity gospel. You see, that's what the, the young man in this story had bought into, that somehow wealth and possession was a sign of your spirituality. In other words, the more you had, that meant you were in better standing with God, and oh, that person was poor. Well, then it must be the opposite. Jesus turns that on its head here in, in this account. No, when he talks about us having houses and, and mothers and fathers and, and friends, he's talking about the community that becomes ours. Suddenly your brother, you may be an only child, but suddenly you have brothers and sisters as a Christian throughout the world and throughout God's kingdom that you can't count. We are blessed in ways that we cannot measure. Well, as Reagan and I made our journey, I noticed a group of children were sitting on the sidewalk as we made our way. It was fun. There was a, a group of children there, and there was one young man across the street. And 
it was a visual to me and may not have been, but it looked like the young man just would have loved to have been part of that gathering over there. You could tell that he was watching but was staying at a distance. And, I, and it just reminded me how often that is in the life of the church. We gather, and this is wonderful. So glad for those of you gathering here and gathering online. But I always think of that person who's standing over there wanting to be part of the community wanting to know the joy that's being expressed, whether it's in, in song uh, with the bells and voice or in coming together the fellowship. I had that visual, and so we were walking down there, and the closer I got to them, I discovered that they were playing a board game. They had a game of Monopoly all, all spread out there, and so I, uh, typically as I had this visual, I would have just... Uh, uh, said hello and probably kept going, but thinking about God's, God's kingdom, I, I engaged in conversation. So I said to the young, I said, well, who's winning here? And one young man said, held up the cards of his, pro oh, he says, I'm cleaning up here, he said, and the other sort of scoffed a little. So, so we talked, we, we were in conversation. And then I came across this account. It was of another young man who was learning the game Monopoly from his grandmother. He watched, and she told him, says, now, you need to go home and, and practice here and learn this game. Well, first of all, it reminded me of my own mother, who is very sweet, maybe watching today, I'm going to be 89 years young, but when it comes to a board game, you better bring your A game. She is there, and she's there to win, <laughs> and does most of the time. A Parcheesi game or something, my, my children still try to win, and more often than not, they don't. Well, this young man went home, and he started playing Monopoly. He engaged his sisters, and he engaged his parents and friends, and he learned the game well, and he won, and so he was ready for his match against his grandmother. They played, and the game went a couple hours, and boy, with the roll of dice, why, he, he just cleaned up. He was buying the right properties, and when the game ended, he had won. His grandmother congratulated him, and then she said, I'm going to teach you an even more important lesson. And that is, when the game ends, it all goes back in the box. Now, I don't think she was teaching him the importance of picking up when you're done. I think she was teaching him a, a life lesson there. So often, so much of our energies can go into what we can possess, what we can have, what we need to have, we think. But there's a higher priority, a much higher priority. Because all that, in the end, will it really matter? You've got to provide for your family and yourself, of course, but I'm talking about the extras. That all will go away. But your relationship with Jesus, your role in his community, that's for eternity. You may feel like you're losing right now, and Jesus says those who lose their life will find it. He's talking about the relationship that will continue to be nurtured. And so when we give our thanks to God, when we give back to God, we're not earning our salvation. It doesn't work that way. But rather, we are experiencing a new relationship with God. I close with this account that Janet Wolfe, a great theologian and pastor, offers in her blog, Dance with the Word, Dancing with the Word, I've told you about. She had the opportunity to lead a retreat with the Moravian Church. If you're familiar with the Moravian Church, why, that, uh, they go way back and they played a pivotal role in John Wesley's life, for example. When he was making his journey here to America, to Georgia, it wasn't a cruise line, but rather a, they faced fierce storm and the people were panicking on the ship, except for this group of folks, he called them the Germans, who were there in the corner praying, the Moravians. Well, Dr. Wolf was leading this retreat, and at that they had a love feast, which is a powerful celebration. If you haven't experienced a love feast, uh, Google it sometime. That's part of our Methodist tradition, where there's, there, where there's drink and where there's food in which they, they gather for a time of praise and testimony to God. And that's what happened, and the testimonies were powerful, Dr. Wolf writes. 
And then, as it came to a close, the participants asked, might we say a blessing over you? And they offered, uh, I'll give you the words here, it's almost like the happy birthday song, it's very familiar to, to the Moravian church, but powerful, these words, they sang over her. With your presence, Lord, our head and savior, bless her now, we humbly pray. Our dear heavenly Father's love and favor, be her comfort every day. May God's spirit now in each proceeding favor her with his most gracious leading. Thus shall she be truly blessed, both in labor and in rest. Speaking that over her, Dr. Wolf went on to say, she said, I held on to that and still do. But then it causes me to think, why did that mean so much to me? What is it in my life that is lacking? that folks I hardly knew days before could speak so powerfully and God could use so mightily. Jesus told the young man, one thing you lack. And so I ask you, a couple questions leading up to it. Think about these this week. So what needs straightening out in your life? Just as Jesus did with the young man, why do you call me good? Second, what do you need to trust God with this day? What have you been trying to carry yourself? And what has God entrusted to you? What ministry, what persons, what community has God entrusting you to play a role in? Full involvement with Jesus calls the man away from this world's priorities to those of God. What priorities are you being called to keep in your life? What is God freeing you to do? God's gift of salvation can actually free us to do something, to love each other, to care for God's people and world, to share the good news right here, right now, wherever it may be that God has placed us. Not from any hope of winning God's favor, but rather from a spontaneous kind of basking in God's favor. And lastly, Caroline Lewis put it this way, where do you locate your abundance? Where does your abundance come from? There is one thing you lack, and you need to figure that out. But the issue of lack takes on a particular meaning in the story. It is that which prevents you from a full expression of faith. What is one thing that is at the core of who you are? What keeps you from being the follower, the disciple, the believer, the witness that God wants and needs you to be? May you be open to God. May you offer your thanks to God, and God will bless and use you, I promise. Amen. Please join me as we offer together our prayer of confession. Lord, we look for you in the wrong places. We put our trust in material things. We worry about things we cannot change. We wonder if you are even there at all. For all the times we have doubted you, Lord, forgive us. For all the ways we have neglected your word and ignored your people, forgive us. Do not be far from us, Lord. There is no one else we can turn to for help. Renew our fickle hearts and help us put our trust in you. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. There is no wrong that God cannot make right. There is no chasm that can separate us from God's love. The Lord is patient and kind, generous and good. God will not forsake you or leave you. Turn to the Lord with confidence and put your faith in God's great mercy. By the power of Jesus Christ, we are made whole. Amen. And so with gratitude and thanksgiving, we give thanks for your weekly offering, what's being given online, being mailed in, and what has been brought here today. Please know that your gifts are helping folks to know the joy that God is with them, and that we as a church are seeking to be community for all who feel like they are standing apart. Through your offering, your thanks offering, 
you are making a difference. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, Deacon Helen will lead us in our morning prayer. Friends in Christ, let us pray. Almighty God, when it is hard for us to see your kingdom, when our vision is clouded by doubts and distractions, when the way forward is hidden or seems impossible, thank you for reminding us that all things are possible for you. We are grateful humbled and amazed that you see us, know us, and love us. Thank you for calling us, for reassuring us, for nudging us forward when we become so stuck in our fears, our pride, our possessions, our situations, our own ways, that we turn away from you and our neighbors. Help us to keep your son at the center of our lives, to follow him through seasons of both hope and despair, to seek his light when we have trouble seeing the faithful path that you want us to take, to set aside everything else and give our whole selves to him, to be faithful and generous stewards of your good provision. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming near to us and to all people who are grieving, who are suffering from loss and loneliness, who live in fear, who are experiencing pain or illness. Teach us to carry your peace more and more into the world. We pray for victims of gun violence and for those who pull the trigger. We pray for all who are addicted to excess and for all people in all places who do not have a regular and reliable source of adequate and nutritious food. We pray for everyone who is not living in relationship with you or who feel separated from you. Holy Spirit, as you carry the gift of grace into us and into all of God's good creation, we pray for open and contrite hearts, for healing and salvation, for the glory of God to work in us and through us. We lift our voices together with all of the saints across time and place to proclaim the miracle that Christ is bringing God's good kingdom more and more into this world each and every day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite all who are able to please stand as we join in singing in the playing of our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
Please be seated. Before closing, I want to uh, mention something as I was sharing about my mother. She's actually in Disney World today as I speak. You see, she has a new uh, great-granddaughter who is being baptized this morning. And this is her grandson, Thomas, and his wife, Lauren. They both work at Disney as imaginators. Can you imagine how cool that would be if your parents uh, worked at Disney and you were being raised in that? And yet, there's a higher priority. She is being baptized in the faith and being surrounded by a community that's going to support her in life's journey. And what's warming to my heart is Thomas was the first baptism I ever got to do. And to see that continue reminds me of a God who is at work this day and each day. I'm giving thanks for what's happening in baptism. Let us give thanks as God works through us. I invite you to hear these words of benediction. So Jesus might just be doing with God. We'll go to the with God, please. With God, all things are possible. May you carry that confidence into your daily life and work as you walk in Christ's footsteps guided by God's hand. Go forth in his name. Amen.